What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode. Got something really, really excited for you today. First interview on the channel. I've got Mike Carroll from Fit for Golf. Guys, Mike is the man. I have so much respect for him and the content he makes and all the programs he does. As you guys know, I'm a big proponent of fitness and I think it's been instrumental to my journey. I'm a subscriber of Mike's program and wanted to bring him on because he provides a ton of free content out there for you guys to see. He's super, super knowledgeable in his field. And I think for all of us trying to get better at golf, one of the best ways to do it is to work on our physical fitness and work on our body. So without further ado, uh, get your popcorn ready. We were supposed to only talk for like 20 minutes. This ended up being a full hour. Some really, really great stuff in here. So sit back, relax, throw this on, and uh, here we go. All right, what's going on, Mike? Thanks for joining me on the channel, buddy. So glad to have you here. Um, guys, so if you're not familiar with Mike, Mike is the man behind fit for golf So he is a uh, strength and conditioning pro and also a golfer. Um, the guy is just puts out so much amazing content. I really wanted to bring him on today because as everybody – kind of goes into 2022 and we've got all these big gear releases and all these exciting things in the golf industry. Um, one thing you guys have heard me talk about all the time on the channel is how important it is to have a body that can drive the ball for you. And there's no better person I would rather have on the channel today to talk about that than Mr. Mike. So Mike, thank you so much for joining me today, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Gabe. My pleasure. That's a, a big intro. So uh, I'll have to try and live up to the hype now with, um, with getting such accolades from yourself. <laughs> Buddy, you're a big man. You're, you're a big man. Guys, if you haven't, if you use Twitter at all, you need to follow Mike on Twitter. I'll link it below. Um, I actually pretty much started using Twitter again, single-handedly because of Mike, because of how much amazing content he puts out on Twitter. So please follow him. I'll link it below. It is the number one follow on Twitter for sure. Um, so yeah. So anyway, Mike, if you just want to give me, uh, give everyone a, just a quick lowdown on uh, who you are, what you do and um, what you're all about. Yeah. So I am a 30 year old strength and conditioning coach uh, specializing with golfers for the last five years. Um, before that, I was working in a variety of other sports, mainly in Ireland. I'm from Ireland. I grew up in Ireland. I went to college there. Uh, I did sports and exercise science in a place called the University of Limerick. And I knew that strength and conditioning, which is basically like personal training or physical training for athletes, is what I wanted to do afterwards. Um, so for about the last 10 or 11 years, I've been training like general population people for just getting in better general health, you know, dropping some fat, gaining some muscle. And also uh, athletes of a variety of different standards. And then five years ago, I moved to the U.S. to uh, Southern California to work in a place called Hanson Fitness for Golf, which was uh, just basically a gym that was for golfers who wanted to get better. And about the same time, uh, I started Fit, the Fit for Golf app. Fit for Golf was the name I'd been working under in Ireland, but solely in a like physical capacity. I didn't have anything online. And kind of slowly, that started gathering momentum and gaining popularity and this year, I uh, left my work in Hanson Fitness for Golf, and I have been full-time just as fit for golf since, basically. Uh, so my time is split now at the moment between looking after like the, the general public or the kind of regular golfer subscribers on the app, and I also have a number of tour pros that I work a little bit more closely with, um, kind of talking to them more on a you know regular basis, kind of weekly or multiple times per week for some of them. And then very occasionally I travel to tournaments or to wherever they're based, work with them in person, but mostly working online, basically. Unreal. And that's, and that's what I think uh, is what I, uh, you know, respect the most about you and what you do is you teach such a broad spectrum of people, um, you know, so much about your field and on, on top of, you know, having people at the highest level and then also just working with kind of the everyday golfer, um, you've done a similar journey as me uh, with dropping your handicap. So you actually are practicing and putting into play all the things you're teaching to everybody. Like you dropped your handicap from, I think you were a five to now you're like a plus plus one or something. Yeah, five to plus one in a year and a half, kind of from right. like May, May, uh 2020 to December 2021, basically, or November 2021, um, just just playing and practicing way more and kind of taking it a bit more seriously, basically. 
Unreal, unreal. And guys, again, follow Mike on Twitter. He doc he documents all of his progress on there too, so you can see him ripping. That actually, you got a pretty nice range you get to practice at, which is uh. Which yeah. So what's is funny? What's funny about that range is everybody looks at it and they're like, "Oh my god, that place looks amazing," but it's they. I think everybody when they see the green area in front of me, they think it's grass, but it's actually all, it's just, it's just a really, really thin layer of AstroTurf on top of concrete. <laughs> so so they're, like, fake, they're fake and baking it really exactly. good. Exactly. So like you, you can't, you've no idea how far the ball goes because once it hits the ground, it just bounces up in the air, but it is, it's, it's, it's a fine range. My favorite part about that range is um, the back of the range is about like 230 but it's a really tall fence and there is really tall like uh, supporting poles at the back of the range and they're 15 yards apart and like there's probably oh, about 10 of them across the range so you know you can if you're hitting drivers you can kind of aim at one of the poles and if you're one pole left or right you're within 15 yards which is pretty sick with a driver and if you're within two poles it's 30 yards left or right which is still pretty good and then if you're outside that you kind of know you're in a little bit of trouble that's, that's a great way to practice yeah I love it. I love it. Um, okay. So talking about fitness, you know, I personally, I'm of the opinion that the most under, um, undervalued, you know, thing in golf is how, what, how you can fix your body to become a better golfer. I think, you know, with golf getting so expensive and we're seeing such a big thing in the golf boom right now where, you know, uh, prices are driving and with COVID and everything, it's just getting worse, right? I think the new TaylorMade drivers retailing at 780 uh, golf balls now are going through the roof, right? So the price of getting better at golf, it seems to be going really high. But the one thing we all can control, um, and actually so many people don't have time to go to the golf course, but something you can do at home in your normal life is just fix your body. You know, we all have so many things with our body that aren't actually, you're working optimally because most of us like myself, like, you know, I spent 10 years sitting in front of a music console. My body was not ready to play golf. And it's only been through investing so much into my body over the past two years that I've really grown an appreciation for taking care of myself and, and just not even on like a golf level, just on like a happiness human level, the benefit of doing that. So, you know, from what you're seeing in the evolution of the golf industry right now, you know, for someone who wants to get better and doesn't know where to start with golf fitness, you know, using your program with what you, with, with your knowledge, like how do you, how do you get going so that you can become a better golfer um, with the stuff you provide? Yeah. Like honestly, probably the, the easiest thing to do and it's free is I, I try and put out some educational or sample video of an exercise every day on on twitter and instagram um, or even like a, a mini workout that people can do from home but it's it's as simple as you said really i think for most people it's just a matter of getting started and doing something um not obsessing about what they're doing is say perfect or optimized it's it's really a matter of of getting your body moving like simple things that people can do at home or things like squats step ups lunges some push-ups, even simple things like front and side planks and sit-ups and stuff like that. And some basic mobility exercises, you know, practicing rotating your hips, rotating your torso, arm circles, things like this. Um, and really, to be honest, like people who aren't doing anything, once they start doing something at all, moving their joints through a full range of motion and stressing the muscles a little bit with basic bodyweight exercises, they start seeing a big difference straight away, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I think like you're talking about golf improvement and kind of developing a golf as you go up levels of golf, you definitely see that the physical condition of the players gets better. Like their physical capabilities are, are really helping them rather than holding them back. And I think a lot of, you know, middle-aged people are older and even younger people, to be honest, depending on sort of what they've done in the past, like sort of step one, I would say, is trying to make sure that you don't really have any, any like nagging injuries or huge, you know, red flags holding you back. There's sort of nothing worse than someone who's eager to practice and play golf more, but like their shoulder or their elbow or their back or something like that is really limiting how much they can do. So I'd say that's step one is kind of trying to clear up any, any nagging issues you have. And then step two, you can look into basically developing your physical qualities, things like mobility, strength, power, and even just your general conditioning to make sure you sort of have enough endurance and energy to cover, you know, like the amount of practice and play you want to do, basically. 
And that was the thing that I found really interesting about your content and the stuff you put out is that I think from a 10,000 foot view of somebody who doesn't know fitness, sometimes it seems like, you know, you have to have these like crazy golf specific workouts and it's got to be this like this crazy thing. And, and really actually what I, you know, and you have this one tweet that you put out constantly, you know, golf's really simple. It's like squat, hinge, like just the, the basic things. And you actually break down, it's very simple to improve your body. And, and so if you just want to touch on like a little more, just the simplicity of, a, you know, it doesn't have to be golf specific. It's just actually doing these things consistently over time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I definitely try and approach, I think where people get wrong, I'll kind of backtrack a little bit. I think people get a little bit confused with golf specific and they think about it needs to be things that resemble the golf swing that look like the golf swing. And while that's not bad by any means, and some exercises in a, in a good program may, may look like the golf swing, we're looking to create specific adaptations in the body or a, a kind of phrase that I prefer to use then specific or specificity is transfer. Like how well does this training transfer to, to my golf basically. And for that real general training that makes essentially what I try and tell people is if you can improve the mobility of your joints and the strength of your muscles, that's going to be extremely specific to helping you with your golf. Um, so like kind of main joints, things like ankles, knees, hips, spine, shoulders, neck, if we can improve the mobility of these joints, which are really, really important for developing like good range of motion in our swing, and we can develop the strength of our main muscle groups, like, and you're, you're practicing your golf swing and you're hitting golf balls, like you're, you're going to see a transfer from that training, a problem that people run into when they try and make all of their training exercises resemble the golf swing is they often don't really have enough stress to do anything to change their body. And they're often not actually specific enough to what happens the golf swing in terms of speed or coordination to actually impact their golf swing. So they end up sort of in a gray area doing something that fair enough, it kind of mimics the golf swing, but it's not in any way stressful enough to, to make the body change in terms of its physical capabilities And it's still very different to what actually happens when hitting a golf ball. So it might not be doing a whole lot for your swing either. So I I tend to try and approach, try and improve people's physical capabilities on one side and then allow them and their coach or whatever work on their, their golf swing and their golf technique on the other. And it's not to say that no exercises in your program should look like a golf swing or resemble it because some of the ones that I prescribe definitely do but I'm not prescribing them because they look like a golf swing, if that makes sense. Fair. And I, and I think that gray area point of you saying where it doesn't stress you enough <laughs> to, to push, you're kind of just like, you feel like you're doing something, but you're not actually moving forward. That's very, very interesting. Yeah. Like you'd, you'd be better off just doing like a mobility or strength training session or getting a golf club in your hand and doing your drills. I think when people try and do, you know, certain things with dumbbells or, you know, bands or something like that, that they're trying to work on maybe like a swing fault or swing tendency. Again, there's nothing wrong with it. It might be helpful, but I think it's a poor use of time compared to just working on your mobility and strength or getting a golf club in your hand and doing some drills either with or without a ball really, you know, because like I'm, like I, I know and from talking to players, you know, we hear about specific swing tendencies, you know, why they might be related to physical limitations or like it really bugs me on social media when you see a, a gym exercise prescribed for, you know, this might help with, let's just say, coming over the top in your golf swing and somebody's working on a, a separation exercise or something like that. And like, that's fine, but we need to remember that our golf swing is a really deeply ingrained motor pattern from how we learned to hit the ball. Right. So there's just very little likelihood of something you're doing at a very slow speed in the gym with something that is not really tied into hitting a successful golf shot with a, with a like golf club and golf ball. It's just a very different, basically, um, what, what am I trying to say? It's basically a very different task for our brain to coordinate with the timing and the speed and 
basically the way that a golf club is designed and how we want to deliver to a golf ball and the millions or thousands of times that we've done it in a certain way. I think it's really, really important that we don't overestimate how much we can change that with like a medicine ball exercise in the gym right. or some sort of dumbbell exercise. Not that they're not useful. They might be. Yeah. But I think that they will basically put your body in a better position to make the swings you want to, but there's no way your swing is changing when you're feeling a little bit nervous on the 16th hole. You've got a, you know, a tight driving hole and you're lining up your target. There's, you know, trouble everywhere. Like that gym exercise is not showing up unless you've right. had lots and lots of, of real skill training, I would say, with a golf club and golf ball in your hands. And that's really interesting because going through the swing change myself over the past year and, and seeing that evolve, but in tandem with that, I've been doubling down even harder on the workouts. And it's, what, it's, it's true, the, the, the working out hasn't changed my swing, but it's allowed me to get into better positions. So I would say, you know, especially when it comes to side bend, um, leg work was a big issue for me, being able to fire my legs properly and properly utilize my ground forces. You know, a, a big issue I was having in my swing before was that I, I didn't have the core strength to get the side bend consistently the right way that I needed to based on how me and my coach were designing it. And so you're right, a med ball throw was never going to get me into that position, but, or, or, or change that for me. But through doing all the workouts along with the swing, I was then able to get into better positions. So that's, that's really cool. Um, question for you in terms of mobility versus strength work, because I would say self, you know, myself, I've probably done 90% strength work. And as a result, I've seen definitely mobility benefits. I do a mix of, you know, all the stuff you've, you've got on your programs and between bands and kettlebells and things like that. I haven't personally felt the need to be, stretching all the time. Like I used to stretch a ton when I was sitting at my desk and I, my body felt like trash. Whereas like now I like with the amount of training and how hard I'm hitting my body, I actually have way less mobility issues. I don't know if you see that with, you know, with just through doing the strength stuff. And I guess a lot of the stuff we're doing through your programs, it's, it's very functional in terms of the movements, like they're dynamic. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of see, you know, that mobility versus strength and through working on the stuff, I'm seeing better, better mobility, but I'm not, I don't feel like I'm actively working on it. Yeah, so it's, it's a very old myth that strength training or lifting weights will basically uh, negatively impact flexibility or mobility, but it isn't true at all. Um, like we have, there's tons of research to, to back this up in, in the <clears throat> scientific literature that uh, strength training through a full range of motion for you based on your current mobility level is just as effective at improving range of motion as stretching or standard mobility work. And what I also like about it too is when you're strength training through as large a range of motion as you can in whatever movement, you're not just working on mobility, you're also getting stronger the whole way through that range of motion. So then it means that you're going to be probably less likely to get injured when you're accessing that range of motion in your swing or in your, in your sport, if it's another sport. Um, and also by training it with weights and getting stronger, you're also going to be able to produce more force through that range of motion. So there's a better chance that you're going to be more powerful yeah. with that. With, with that so I, I'm a huge proponent of like good quality strength training is very, very beneficial for mobility. For like, a, just if we give one example, let's just say we take a squat movement, for example, like there's no doubt that the mobility of your ankles and your hips and your knees is going to improve by practicing by basically by doing squats in your training, you know, reasonably heavy for whatever your strength level is and gradually, you know, increasing the range of motion as you get more comfortable. But I'm also a huge proponent of doing some direct mobility work that isn't, that isn't uh, strength training. And the reason for that is, there's certain movements, I would say, that are much easier to isolate and target and improve by doing them as mobility exercises rather just than hoping they come as a byproduct from strength training. What I mean by that is that there's certain mobility exercises I prescribe for things like internal hip rotation and thoracic right. spine rotation that I think we can get very good mobility benefits from, and they respond very well to, let's just say, 
body weight or or a mobility style of loading as opposed to trying them loading for like as opposed to trying to load them for like a heavy set of five reps you know what i mean so like i'm i'm happy for someone to do like a heavy set of squats for let's say five or six reps and saying yeah like that's going to be really useful for the mobility of your ankles and your knees and your hips but if i'm giving someone like an internal hip rotation drill or something like this our body isn't particularly robust or strong in some of these exercises that can be really useful for improving mobility. So I think they should be in the program too, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Totally. And I, that's something now I'm starting to, I, I realized I kind of need to add in more as my swing has gotten better. And especially when it comes to creating depth in the backswing. Yeah. I've, I've noticed now the need to really work on, on those elements. Yeah. But, um, but specifically, you know, through doing full range of motion stuff, you have one exercise, I'll link it below where it's like a cable pull. Um, and that's one of my favorites because I, you know, I DM'd uh, Mike probably two months ago because I was having like issues back here from just so many swings, right? Just the constant pulling and the constant pulling. And I was actually through working, it, it, I tried foam rolling, I tried everything. Um, and it wouldn't go away. And so it actually wasn't until we and I, you and I talked and I saw you, you post that exercise and I started really actually loading that aggressively in the gym, putting a lot of weight and actually like hitting that body part super hard in the gym that now I have no pain on that side. Um, and I'm probably, and my, my swing speed pretty nasty right now. Um, yeah, so, it's sick. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting of like how you know, cause conventional wisdom would say you got to stretch it out, do, do some yoga, like treat it lightly. Right. And I think what, what's been interesting through going through this journey is that actually just by hitting my body harder sometimes and, and putting it under stress and, and kind of testing myself. Um, I've seen just, I guess, better, better mobility, better health. I, I don't like for the amount of balls I hit over the past two years, um, like knock on wood, like I got no injuries. I got nothing. Um, yes. So like if, if someone is struggling with a, with a soft tissue injury, which is usually like muscle or tendon, um, and it's, it's pretty clear to the person that it's uh, related to the volume of practice they're doing or the amount of play they're doing, what that's a sign of is that that area of your body, so like let's say it was kind of your upper back and rear shoulder area, like that was a sign that that part of your body wasn't conditioned enough to deal with the stress you were putting on it with all of your golf practice so what you're trying to do with strength training is to is to load that area and stress it a certain amount so that you make it stronger and better conditioned and now it's able to deal with the stress you're putting on it from your golf practice that's kind of the idea of say rehab or like another term that people use is kind of prehab to try and and stop those things developing in the first place but anybody like that I know who's who's who hits tons and tons of golf balls like that's a lot of stress on the body so if we can make our bodies stronger and resistance training or you know strength training with weights or bands or whatever resistance tool you want to use is a way that we can really really um strengthen certain parts of our body that might be lagging behind or based on the the swing changes that we're working on or based on the way we swing they get stressed a lot with our practice and play. We can try and strengthen them and get them in better condition so that they're now better equipped to deal with the stresses of our practice and play. Does that right. make sense? Totally. And uh, and that, sorry, sorry to interrupt. That would yeah. kind of go against the conventional wisdom of if an area is giving you trouble, that you rest it or stretch it until it feels okay. And then you go back to your practice. But that doesn't really make sense because if you take say, let's say three or four or however many weeks of rest from the activity that was causing you issues, fair enough, the pain or the symptoms or discomfort might be gone away, but you need to remember now that you've also lost general conditioning in that area. Right. You haven't done anything for that area for a certain amount of time. So you're actually much better off. Like I would say, basically attacking a troublesome body part and trying to get it stronger rather than resting it because if you get stronger and better conditioned it's now going to be better equipped to deal with the stress from swinging as opposed to resting it fair enough the pain or the discomfort goes away but now your condition has dropped 
you go back to swinging, it returns, you rest, you go back to swinging, it returns, because you've basically proven that that part of your body isn't able to deal with the stress. But if you get stronger with certain exercises and gradually build it up, and then you gradually return to your volume of ball hitting, there, there, there should be a much better strategy. And that's exactly what, when, when you and I were talking, had I let it, I'd st- still be nagging me. Like now, like it's nothing now. And it used to be, it used to be quite annoying. Like I could feel it at the end of the day or even in the mornings and through putting it under load, it like, I'm fine. Like it's, it's, it's to the point now where I get excited to kind of, now I can go even more aggressive in the gym. Yeah. Um, and I'm, just, and I, like I had two and a half hours with my coach today and like totally, and I'm yeah. in minus five degree weather. So it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm swinging in the cold. So yeah, it's, it's, it's proofs in the pudding of like, yeah. And, and then one of the kind of a, an added bonus and they usually come hand in hand is that type of training, the general or the gradual strengthening that makes us more resistant to injury. Well, what happens when you're gradually getting stronger is like, what that really means is that you're now able to produce more force. Your muscles are stronger, which is likely to have a really nice effect on your swing speed too. So yeah, you're, it's, you're, it's, you're, you're a double effect you're getting less prone to injury and you're you're hitting the ball further so speaking of speed you are the master of speed this is one of your this is one of your favorite things that you are locked in on um so i when it comes to speed everyone's jumping on the either the, they're getting the stack system or they're getting the speed sticks right everybody wants more speed because as you know you're a bit you're you use Gar, uh, mark brody's golf metrics like you know he's the man that he's like the stats show more distance better scores. You can hit it long, keep it in play. That's what you got to do, right? Now, when it comes to gaining speed, I, I've gone about it now two ways. And I think personally, if you just get the speed sticks and don't back it up in the gym, you may see initial bumps. And I guess some of the neurological stuff you're getting from the speed sticks. But I, I think personally, you're risking some injury from like just trying to swing out of your shoes without the, the, the strength to back it up. So for someone who's like wants to add speed to their game, what's the best regimen of, of putting it all together? Um, just first, I would definitely not say that I'm the master of speed, but uh, I, I'm certainly pretty obsessed with it and very interested in it. To answer your question, there is definitely a number of different ways that we can gain speed. There's, there's no doubt about it because there's just enough evidence to, to show that this is true. So 100%. People can definitely gain swing speed by just going and using speed sticks or just going and using the stack or even not using any of those speed tools, just swinging their own golf clubs as fast as they can for speed training. I would say that when they're doing that, it's actually the radar for speed feedback and being able to track your speed and motivate yourself to keep going faster and faster is more important than the tool you're using. Um, so you can definitely gain a lot of speed doing that. There, there's no doubt about it because tons of people have. Um, you can definitely gain speed by not really working on your speed at all, uh, specifically, and just by getting stronger in the gym, getting your muscles. Which, which is what I've been doing. I've, I stopped speed training 10 months ago. I, like, I, I basically stopped using speed sticks, and I, yeah, I exclusively work out. You, you still, I, I well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say you still do speed training though with your own clubs and balls. Like you're still pumping driver pretty hard. Yes, yes. I'm just not using speed sticks or the stack system. Yeah, to, so like, to do that. Exactly. So I would still definitely classify that as speed training. Okay. Uh, what you're doing, it's just you're not using one of the tools as such. Gosh. Um, but kind of where I would, I would, sort of or what I would try and make people aware of is kind of the way that I try and break it down is that if you consider the speed training tools are are just practicing with your own golf clubs to get faster and faster I think that you can definitely get a lot faster uh, by doing that but you will hit a plateau and you won't get any faster without getting stronger So a way of considering it might be that if we take two players, if we have someone that is, let's just say, very weak in general, they they haven't really done any strength training, they're not involved in other sports, 
let's just say we take two 40 year olds for, for argument's sake, right? right? And I know there's tons of other variables can go into it, but this would be a good enough analogy for people to understand. So if we take a very weak 40 year old, that's not in good physical condition, they haven't trained in the past. And we, and we take another 40 year old who say is pretty strong, has been working out a lot. Um, you know, basically they look after themselves with strength training. I would basically be kind of looking at that, the person who, and we give them both speed training. We, we give them both a new set of speed sticks or the stack or whatever. I'd be willing to bet like over the grand scheme of things in general, again, there's loads of variables will go into this, but the person who is very, very weak, hasn't trained in the, in the past, I would, let's just say they gain seven miles an hour in, in 12 weeks they might be going from say like 85 miles an hour to 92 miles an hour. But I bet you the person who's never done speed training, but has been really, really strong from their like gym work and just getting generally better physically, they're probably already going to be starting at like a hundred or, or so because their body is in such a better condition. So if they gain seven miles an hour, they're going from a hundred to 107. Right. Does that make sense? So they're oh. going to be like their, their ceiling for speed is going to be way higher because their body is in such better physical condition for generating speed and power. Well, because from what I've seen in my own personal experiment of all this is that I think core strength is so undervalued when it comes to golf. People just don't realize that how much a stable core can help you with everything, even just like putting, like keeping a putt online. You need, you got to, you got to squeeze the abs. You know, like, it, like it, it's not just about hitting it far. And so when I see guys just getting the speed sticks and just swinging as hard as they can without reinforcing that, I wonder if that's, the, the, you're just spinning your tires versus actually being productive. Yeah, like I, I, would, I would disagree a little bit, to be honest, Gabe, okay. just, be, ju- just, just because like I've, I've talked to so many people like via email or just on social media that have made huge improvements from their game from only adding in something like the okay, speed cool. sticks or the stack. Um, I would say that there are often people though who are maybe, well, no, it's, it's, it's come from a lot of handicap ranges, I would say, because like those protocols are just giving people so many extra swings per week. And I think the variety of different weights as well, especially if they're not doing anything else, that is quite a big stimulus for them to get stronger. And right. one of the things too, like that I think people almost forget about sometimes with the speed sticks is that a lot of the drills that are in the speed stick protocols, I think that they actually help a lot of people improve their swings. So the this, this step, this so, step so change the, drills, the double so, step. So there's secondary benefits that are happening. Yeah. yeah. And that was, again, that was more out of curiosity to, to get your take on because um, personally, I, I think for me sitting at the desk for as long as I did, I think my core strength was just so bad that I, that I almost needed to do both. Um, but I was curious that if, if, like you, there, if you needed it or if you could kind of see benefits. Either like way. there's, there's, there's no doubt that, and like, this is how I set up like every single program that I prescribe for people. Basically, there's no doubt that speed training plus strength training is better than either of them on their own. Like there's just, there's just no doubt about that. Basically what I think happens people with speed training is that they get a very quick bump up in speed then they plateau hard and it's really, really difficult for them to get faster. I think those people, the only way that they're going to get significantly faster is by increasing their raw materials. So by making their muscles bigger and stronger, then they can now use their bigger and stronger muscles and re-implement that speed training. And now they're doing speed training with stronger muscles. Right. So they're likely to get faster again. But if someone only ever trains with basically very light loads and trying to move them very quickly, which is what any speed training is, I think they're going to hit a plateau. And if we look at, like even anecdotally, if we look at the fastest swingers in the world, all of them do both. Yeah. Like you you, you yes. don't have anybody like swinging, you know, like 140 miles an hour just because they practice hitting a ton of drivers fast. Right. They're, they're all beasts. Right. They're all really, really strong. Which is, oh, go ahead. Right, last point. What I will say, though, 
And it all comes down to how much time somebody has, what they enjoy doing and what they want to do. Like if you take, say, the average male club head speed of about, I don't know, 88 or so miles an hour, and the average female might be like, I don't know, 80 or 75 or something, I'm not sure. They can probably gain 10 miles an hour just by doing speed training and, and, and never doing strength training, which for them is still like 20 or 25 yards. And they might be delighted with that, you know, but then if they get to a point when it's like, I'm not really getting any faster, well, then they're prob- probably going to need to, um, to, to get stronger, you know? Totally. And to get stronger, you have put together, uh, you have a great app that I want to just feature here to, to kind of close things off, which is your fit for golf app, which has like, so many different programs. And, and what I love is that, again, with everything being so expensive in the golf industry, you have one of the most affordable resources out there. I think it's like, I think I, it's like 16 bucks a month. Or but something. It's, it's, it's 12 USD. 12. Okay. So I'm paying 16 Canadian. That's yeah, right. Yeah, our yeah. dollars, our dollars a little, uh, yeah, it's a little weak. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically $12, which is about, I think like, 10 or 11 euro and about nine pounds, you know, yeah. uh, and British yeah. sterling. And you have so much material in there and, and, and it's great. And I think, you know, as a resource, again, you know, if at a, at a bare minimum, guys, follow Mike on Twitter because that is a resource in itself. But if you want to kick it up or on Instagram, if or Instagram, on Twitter, yeah. Um, or Instagram, both, both are great. But again, for, for 12 bucks American a month, um, I've been a subscriber for just over a year now. And it's, it's great. Like, I think, I think your app's great. So if, if somebody was to sign up for uh, fit for golf, where, it, what would you say is like the first program they should start with? You know, there, there's someone that plays pretty regularly, you know, they're in the seven to 12 handicap range uh, and they just want to kind of improve their general fitness. Yeah. The first thing just for people listening is that the app isn't available directly in the app store yet. It will be soon, but you have to go to my website, fitforgolf.blog, and then you can I'll link it below, right? to and, and download the app from there. Um, but so that it basically depends if somebody is uh, completely new to, to physical training, hasn't done anything in the past. Uh, I usually advise them to start with the one Oh one program, which is designed for people who don't really have any physical training experience. Maybe they're a little bit worried about kind of like how to get started. Um, that program is 12 weeks long. It's split into three, four week phases the first phase of four weeks is really, really easy. Like it's very, very easy. So some people doing that, they might find re- I'm not really doing a whole lot here, but it, that's kind of by design, want to just really give right. them baby steps into it. And then phase two, which is four weeks, ramps it up a little bit. And then phase three, which is four weeks, ramps it up a little bit. And then I would say after the 12 weeks of 101, it's a three training session per week program. Sessions are about 30 to 45 minutes as you go through the levels. Um, after that, then it really depends on the time of year that you sign up. So right now it's kind of the middle of winter. There's not many people playing golf. Um, I have two like off-season programs, basically. Right. One is called the off-season program. That was created about four years ago. And a lot of people who have been multi-year subscribers on the app had done that a number of times um, and wanted something a little bit new. So I just added a program called Winter Strength. Uh, and both of those are like reasonably challenging, kind of high, I would say, uh, like not high volume, but a moderately high volume of, of lifting, especially for, for golfers, um, because people aren't practicing and playing, you know, quite as, uh, right. whatever, if you're not playing as seriously as in the summer. And then there's a couple of other programs that are a little bit less in volume and kind of max lifting and focus a bit more on power production and you won't be as tired and you can put more effort into your playing basically. And uh, probably the best one for that is called the in-season power program. So that's a, a much smaller, um, I would say a lower stress program so that it's still easy to work on your strength and power but not quite with the same volume of training that might be suitable for the winter. And that's what I'm going to be doing around April. Once tournament season kicks in, that's my, that's my in-season yeah. power program. Yeah. Where, where a lot of people go wrong. Um, and this goes through all levels of the game is people work reasonably hard in the winter. And then when the summer or the playing season comes around, they ditch all their training and then they start to and get they just play and they get progressively weaker throughout the season. And if your season is five or six months long, like there's no way that after like you could, you might be able to maintain your strength for like two or three weeks without lifting. 
but after like four or five plus weeks, like your strength and power is going to be going down and you'll you'll probably find that your speed is going down too. But what's really, really nice about strength training and power training and speed training that a lot of people don't know, it's exceptionally easy to maintain gains once you've made them, even if you're only training like once or twice a week for pretty easy sessions. So it's, it's way, way harder to make progress especially once you're past kind of the newbie or beginner stage, then it is to maintain, to maintain progress. So even if you only train once a week in the summer, if you're like, no, I want to practice and play as much as possible, even training like once a week is well worth it rather than right. leaving it go for kind of three, four or five months. That's good to know. That's good to know. Cause as I, I gotta, once I get into the summer, I'm gonna have to find that balance. Cause right now I'm training five, six days a week. Yeah. Uh, and but again, once I start ramping up to playing more, it's not going to be sustainable to do that. So that's, that's good. That's, to know for me. that's the hard, that's the hardest thing for the pros that I work with is, is trying to get that balance right because their season is, is so long uh, that they can't afford to not train in season. Cause their season is like basically a, wrap, 11, a, 10, a full year, <laughs> 10, 10 or 11 months of the year, basically. Um, but it's, it's been interesting. Like, and it's definitely possible to like, these guys are, are playing and practicing more than any of us and they can definitely like maintain or even improve like strength and power and speed during a competitive season. But it's a very different amount of training compared to if they get like eight weeks off where they've no, no competition. Right. Like, the, go, the goals change a little bit basically in those periods of time, because in your off season, your main goal can be physical development, but in season, obviously your goal is, is, is golf scoring basically so you need to accept that there has to be a slight tone down in physical training if you want to really maximize your your golf course ability totally yeah and i'm i'm in the midst of that right now i'm i'm slugging 4500 calories a day and lifting like a madman so when you're, <laughs> what, what what's your swing speed at you said it's nasty at the moment you up in the mid 120s yeah like cruising speed with the driver right now my average is like 124 yeah that's like, like today today sweet. yeah we're and i'm I'm working way less hard to cruise at 124. Like I, I, I'm not really trying to swing as hard as I can anymore. It's like I, like I was last year. Last year I, I was just trying to push speed, push speed, push speed. Now I've put such a focus on strength and controlled speed with a good swing. So what, what sort of ball speeds are you getting on that? Are they, are they range balls you're, you're hitting? Yeah, you range balls. So I'm peaking at the like mid-170s or something? Yeah, 174 to 178. Um, that's and, very good with range balls. Like, Yeah, so that's, that's where – and I'm using a Ping G425 LST. So, you know, I, I typically don't see as high ball speed numbers with that driver versus some of the other hotter drivers, um, which you have the same one, right? You're using Ping as well. Yeah. yeah. So I, where I've seen actually the biggest gains is like my iron – swing speed yeah like, like today my four iron was like 112 wow not even trying like that's wow. me and i like just swinging with my coach how, how much of it do you was that that was on like a flight scope or something then flight scope, or like, yeah yeah like that's crazy um how much of that do you think is from improvements in your mechanics as opposed to just like you're getting stronger 50 50 you have, you've obviously been doing so much work on your speed it's, it's 50 50 50 I've always been, I've been fast, but, but the, the, what I didn't have before that I have now is with better mechanics, specifically with my ground forces, I'm able to, um, and it, it's, it's, it's tough to explain cause I'm not a, I'm not a golf coach specifically with my lead leg, the way I can push off of my right leg and plant my leg now, if I've actually, I saw it today in my lesson when I wasn't really consciously about it. Um, you know, my swing speed would be lower. I was probably swinging my four iron at like 107. Right. As soon as I plant that lead leg, I can get a four to five mile yeah, per yeah. hour increase when I'm properly turned. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of um, like, that goes back a little bit to what I was saying about uh, one of the reasons why I think the speed sticks or the stack and things like that can be so beneficial too, is that especially for say kind of like mid handicap or slightly higher handicap golfers is that, when they're hitting a golf ball, like obviously we all, we all hit tons of miss hits and bad shots, but they're, they're more common for, for mid and high handicappers. They're often reluctant to swing fast at a golf ball because they want to make solid contact. They're worried about where the ball is going to go, which is obviously a good thing when you're, you know, playing a competitive round or whatever. 
But when the ball is removed and people are just given the goal of swinging fast, often they start moving their body much more efficiently and much more dynamically. And it gives them a chance to get used to feeling these more athletic dynamic swings. And at first, yes, it might be tough for them to coordinate this and find the center of the face, but over time, it, it makes them a way better golfer because when they swing faster, they often actually, to, to keep swinging faster, they often tend to actually improve their swings. A lot of people think that when they swing faster, their swing gets worse, but not really. Like, because when you look at faster and faster swingers, their technique is usually really, really good. And even, mm-hmm. and even some of the drills like that are in the speed sticks, like the step change drills and the double step and things like that. And the heel stomp, they're almost like ingraining this, these things that you're talking about here with ground force but making them pretty simple and athletic to do. It's almost like the same way you'd step into like hit a tennis ball or, or swing a baseball bat or something like that, you know? Um, yeah. And, and I then, would say, oh, sorry, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Cause I would say where, when the balance of technique versus the strength. So one of the thing I, one thing I knew coach when we kind of did a bit of a, a tear down on my swing in August to, to push it away than where I was going. Um, I knew I had to get stronger to hit a certain position. So, so I I knew I had to get a certain level of strength to get the bend I wanted to get to hit the fade a certain way with the driver, because I, my goal is to hit this power fade and I could hit a, I could hit a draw with worse mechanics, but for me personally, body to commit to a fade requires me to really be strong in certain positions. I knew I had to get there uh, in order to do that. And then through better technique now though, like you're saying with, um, cause one thing I didn't like about how I was playing in competition wasn't utilizing my speed and my strength. Cause I was, a, I, I still had that fear. And so with better mix now with strength, I'm, I'm taking that mentality of swinging freely and swinging hard now. Yeah. But I can control it cause my body doesn't feel like it's out of whack at those yeah. speeds. Yeah. Kind of another point then that I think is, is really important. Like, is that I'm, as big a proponent for like swing speed training as you will find. Like, obviously I make a living from it. I'm a ambassador for the stack and speed sticks. Like, so I'm, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of them, but what I think is super important for people to, it, it does depend on their, uh, say opportunity to, to hit golf balls as such, but most people, even I would say relatively good players, I'm not saying don't work on speed, but like realize that swing speed is only a, a element of distance, which is what we're really concerned with. Like, because like, and again, like I'm a proponent of this type of work. I think it's very beneficial. Like we do need to remember that if it's someone who's trying to get better at golf, we're obviously trying to transfer any of the swing speed training we're doing into lower scores, like in, into driving the golf ball better on the course. And I think that there's definitely benefit to people getting as a large portion of say their speed training or their distance training with a golf club and golf ball so that they can practice things like even like strike location, you know, stuff like spraying, like for, for anybody who's listening, who's a honestly, even a low handicapper, but definitely a mid handicapper. If they've never sprayed the face of their driver, and hit 15 golf balls and seeing how erratic their strike pattern is right. relative to the center. Like that's, that's, that's massive. Like, you know, it's, it's amazing how much distance is available for most people by improving the kind of technical term is their launch conditions, which is basically their te- which is basically their technique, like where the ball is making contact on the face of the driver, their angle of attack, their dynamic loft on the driver, like those things are so critical and and that's where I was brutal so last year I got I peaked at like 131 swing speed but my mechanics were absolute trash yeah and so I was spinning and launching the ball way too high I wasn't taking advantage of any of that speed because my dynamic loft was absolutely atrocious so now I can deliver probably um, you know five to seven miles per hour less but my dynamic loft is amazing I'm taking spin off the ball I'm launching it great and I'm in it, you know, in the right windows exactly. without having to nearly swing out of my shoes. Yeah. So, and that's, that's where say like, so you're somebody talking about that from like 
the top 1% of swing speeds, you know, in the world, basically at someone, you know, who's like 125 plus, like, so for you, like, obviously getting, you, you can be the best driver of the golf ball in the world, probably with 125, if you're, if you're hitting it accurately enough, you know, but on the flip side, there's going to be people listening. Their club head speed might be 83 miles an hour. And for them, I would say like, it doesn't matter how efficient you get golf is going to be really difficult to make a lot of pars or give yourself many greens in regulation because the speed is not just, is just not there. So I would say for them, like it has to be number one priority, like swing faster, like, like don't worry so much about strike and dynamic loft and these things because they go for it. They, they can be like optimized and dialed in later for that person. It's a, it's a matter of like, they need to get faster and then a lot of people are somewhere, you know, in the middle where they have tons of room for improvement with getting faster and they have tons of room for improvement with these improvements in basically like contact and launch conditions. And then what's really important to remember too is like that often for kind of amateur players, the improvements that they make in their speed and technique will often come together. Like by swinging with better mechanics, their speed will increase but because they're moving better, they'll also be delivering the club better. And that's when, right. like that, that's when things can really take off in terms of like scoring improvements. Like if you're hitting it longer and more in play, like that's, that's, what's great. You know, like, right. like at the exactly. moment, like I, I know for certain at the moment, like I leave a reasonable amount of speed in the tank because like I haven't gotten good enough yet that I can like in terms of my technique and my strike, basically my skill level and my technique isn't good enough for me to swing as fast as I can. Because even though the club head speed might jump by five miles an hour, I'll either miss strike it. So the ball speed won't be any higher or I'll hit like two or three around into bushes or whatever. Right. So now I, now I've lost any of those potential like strokes gained off the tee, right. even though the speed will be higher. So like, it's not rocket science. Kind of the, the challenge is like, yes, I'll gradually try and increase my speed because I also want to be cognizant that as I get older, my speed doesn't drop off. But I also want to make sure that like, like I want to get better. Like I can, I know like last last year, for example, like I just kind of got into like for the fun of it, like trying to get my ball speed as high as I could, like hitting uh, off a simulator into a net, just going wild. And like, as I was doing that, the swing that I was basically like implementing to do that was a completely different movement pattern to anything I'd feel comfortable playing with on the course. And even though the swing speed was going sky high, like I was getting into the low one thirties, often the ball speed wasn't very good because I had no real control. Now over time that might've improved, but it was also just something like I'm working on something here. Yes. There's benefits to it. Like, but am I trying to get better at breaking my ball speed record right. hitting into, a, into hitting into a simulator where, right. where maybe two out of 10 balls is playable? Or am I trying to get really good as like a, as a, as a, you know, golfer basically where I can go to a reasonably challenging golf course, stand there with driver and be like, no, I'm pretty comfortable. I'm pretty confident I can put it into this window. And yes, I might be like, seven miles an hour less or 10 miles an hour less than when you're going wild but that's kind of the balance and it's not that one is better than the other because when we look at the best players and as you go up in standards of golf they tend to be the fastest and also the highest skilled like if right. if you look at like i know most of the people listening are, are amateurs but like if you go through like amateur rankings as you go down in handicap and score players are faster like they hit the ball further but they also hit it more accurately and if you right. look, and if you look at and by more accurately it might not it might not even be more fairways but they're not hitting it into trouble because exactly. hitting it hitting it 20 yards offline at carrying it 290 yards might be the same as hitting it like 10 yards offline carrying it 250 because you kind of have the dispersion cone or funnel going out as the ball carries yeah. further the same degrees offline is going to be a bigger distance offline. And then if you look at the, the best players in the world, like tour pros, if you go through strokes gained off the tee, like it is not a direct correlation between ball speed and strokes gained off the tee. Like there, there is a, an accuracy and skill element comes into it, you know? Um, so it's a balance. And for most players, it's somewhere in the middle. You probably need to improve your speed, 
but there's also probably tons of room for you to hit it further with your current speed. And then there'll be some players on either side. Like there'll be some people whose speed is so low. It's like, look, that speed is never going to be conducive to the type of golf you want to play. Ramp it up. And then there's other people who are probably super fast because they're beasts from other sports or they've trained a ton and their speed is great, but they're spraying it everywhere. That person, you're going to be like, look, your speed is fine, but you know, there's just such a dramatic uh, variance in where your face is pointing and where you're hitting the ball. We need to bring that in. Like you don't need to be speed training three days a week. We need to be, how do I hit the middle of the face and put it somewhere, you know, down the, down the hole, basically. Totally. Well, dude, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Guys, make sure you check out fit for golf. I'll link everything in the description for low. I appreciate you, bro. You're the man. Uh, I know I told you it was going to be 20 minutes, but we just, right. the, <laughs> this, I, I could, I can, yeah, I can let you keep going for an hours at this point. That's, but, uh, that, that, thanks, bro. that's what happens. Uh, and anytime I'm, I'm asked to come on a, a podcast or, or a call about talking about training and speed, it's like, yeah, I think, I think it'll be like 30 minutes. And I tell my fiance, I'm like, yeah, I'm going on a call there. You know, she's like, what's, oh, it's just like a, a podcast. It's about club heads. She's like, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll see you, see you in I'll three see hours. You in three hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, again, thank you so much. Guys, check out Beer for Golf, Mike Carroll. Thank you very much, Gabe. Appreciate it. And good stuff on your golf. It's been very, very impressive following along. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. So pumped to have Mike on the channel. That was awesome. Hope you guys got some value out of that. Again, I've linked all of Mike's links below if you want to check out his stuff. It's provided a ton of value for me and my progression, and I think it'll provide a ton for you. So give it a look when you get a chance. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. Join me on the golf tournament, and I'll catch you on the next one.